All right, Matt Mayo goes here, the legend, NBC Sports Bay Area, the 49ers Talk podcast. Matt, we appreciate you for, for jumping in here. I don't want to speak for Chris. I appreciate you for jumping on with us. I, I, so Kyle, cool. I know you, and I know you would not tell me a lie. So I know for a fact you appreciate me. Chris, on the other hand, I don't think I, I'm still trying to get on his good side. I yeah, you, you you've got some work to do. I mean, I you're you're getting there. You're getting there. Um, yeah, the, we, we miss the you. longer we go without talking, the closer I get to getting there. <laughs> we missed you. We missed you dearly at the Cooperage event, but um, yeah. you know, there's a there's always next year. But, but I Maddie, thanks. You, I did see you Sunday night. That's true. Yeah, I did catch you at the uh, at the Niners Cowboys game, and I guess we can start there. Um, Matt, you've you've covered this team for a long time. You've seen a lot of different iterations of it. Does this like my, my big takeaway, I think, from the first five games of the season, I feel pretty comfortable saying the Niners are the best team in the NFL right, right now, based on what we know. And obviously there's a lot, a lot of football to be played. But when I zoom out and think about this team in the grander context, I kind of think of it like, you know, this is probably the best team the Niners have had, in my opinion, since the 1994 team. Um, and I would even dare to say that like the, the, Christian McCaffrey edition feels kind of similar to the Deion Sanders edition, um, given the impact and and sort of this feeling that that impact might put the team over the top. Um, do you do you agree with that? Do you think this is the best version of the 49ers since 1994? Where would you class this team through five games? Yeah, I mean, that's the key through five games. There's so much football left to be played, but through five games, I, I don't remember the team being as dominant and as workmanlike and as diligent and as dominating on both sides of the ball as they've been through these five games. So, yeah, I, I thought the, the Cowboys were going to be the stiffest competition that they had faced. Um, but probably they still are as far as the best team that they faced through five games, but they just look like they're on a completely different, different level. So yes, through five games, it's really difficult to find a weakness. I think the only weaknesses are basically in names only, meaning, you know, you look at their offensive line, you go, Colton McKibbitts, I never heard of him. He must not be very good. Well, it turns out after week one, he's played very, very good football. You know, you look at the nickelbacks and you go, okay, Isaiah Oliver, Diamador Lenore, and, you know, are they the best nickelbacks in the league? I, Probably not, but I don't know who are the best nickelbacks in the league. And you just look at it, and their numbers are good. You know, yeah, they give up some plays. Every nickelback does. Every cornerback does. But it, the, about the only bad thing I can say about them through this point in the season is they aren't even a third of the way through the season. So it's it's a tough chore to try to show that consistency week in, week out. I mean, it's still what? three months until the playoffs even begin. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, yeah, I would say right now, you know, that, that the 2012 team was really darn good. Mm -hmm. um, the 2000, and the, the, the thing that makes that more like this is because I think after 2011, everybody was expecting the 49ers to be a really good team in 2012. So they came out, of the you know open the season people were kind of gearing for them the 2019 team kind of caught everybody by surprise so it wasn't until you know maybe six games into the season where people started like oh my gosh they're they're a really good team mm -hmm. so this this team has basically since losing in the nfc championship game to the point we are now and of course obviously beyond this point they've been a favorite, if not the favorite to win it all. I think part of it for me, because that's the big thing I keep coming back to is like, it's week five. There are teams who are two and three right now who are going to wind up winning like 12 games. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, <clears throat> they've won 15 regular season games in a row. Like this, this isn't just week five of this year. This goes back to week. Was it eight last year that this started? Um, six, sure. Six, yeah, the, yeah. Week eight of last year that this started. So that's kind it was, of what it was. Ten I, last year, right? Ten last year, and then five this year. Yeah, week yeah. eight's correct. They lost yeah. in week seven to Kansas City. Right, right. Yeah. So I think that's part of the reason that there's so much like optimism that goes beyond just like the regular. Hey, it's week five. It's no. This is kind of two seasons of this, and this is largely the same team. Is is 
Christian McCaffrey the big reason that they've won these 15 in a row? Or how much I, I the I'm trying to in a roundabout way yeah. ask. The, yeah. Is it McCaffrey or is it is it what Brock Purdy's done? Well, I mean, the easy answer and the accurate answer is yes, it's both of them. Uh, who gets more of the credit? Who gets more of the credit? Um, boy. I mean, I think the team changed when McCaffrey came aboard just because he gave them a weapon they've never had before. And he was the the guy that you know the 49ers thought they were getting or hoped they were getting when Kyle Shanahan picked out Jarek McKinnon to be his, you know, the back, you know, Jarek McKinnon was going to be what Christian McCaffrey is. Now he got hurt. You know, he never really panned out with the 49ers and then he went on to the chiefs and he's been a very good player, but Christian McCaffrey is so much better than Jarek McKinnon. So, I mean, he can do everything and does do everything for this team. But I do think that with Purdy, he's enabled Kyle Sheenahan to do everything that he wants to do in his offense, including have a great deal of confidence in the quarterback. Whatever he draws up during the week and coaches up Brock Purdy to do, I, I think it's darn near at the point where it's 100% mm -hmm. where – he tells them what, you know, what the play call is, what the defense should be. And this is the, your read. And this is where the ball should go. Cause this guy should be open. It's a hundred percent. And you know, I mean, Jimmy Garoppolo never had that or never won that kind of confidence, never earned that kind of confidence uh, from Kyle Shanahan that Brock Purdy earned. I mean, almost from the moment he stepped on the field, you know, that, that game against the Dolphins was kind of eye-opening and then playing hurt against Seattle in every game. I mean, it did not take long for anybody to look at the 49ers offense and, and say, wow, he's got the quarterback he wants right now. This guy is, you know, you can't say that a rookie is a finished product, but Brock Purdy stepped in and he looked darn near like a finished NFL product of a quarterback. Yeah, Matt, I was going to, ask you who you thought the best nickelback in the league was but i'm gonna cross that off for now maybe yeah, we can talk about that. it i would love time. to when, when we had that conversation chris <laughs> i would love for you to present in a powerpoint presentation your top five to seven nickelback okay. in the nfl okay great i'll do a zoom invite we share screens it'll be yeah. it'll be fun um but no i i wanted to to ask you about brock Purdy specifically because i think the play on the field speaks for itself Right. Like I think the the production is sort of undeniable. I don't really want to get back into the discussion of like, is he actually good? Is he being propped up by the system? I think both things can be true. Right. He's playing really well within a really good system with really good skill guys. But you've covered uh, like some great quarterbacks, some not so great quarterbacks. There's an element behind the scenes that really matters for quarterbacks. Right. It's leadership, work ethic, how you carry yourself day in and day out. And it sounds cliche. And from the outside, it might not sound super important. But as someone who's there like you are, how is Brock Purdy sort of the human being um, being received by his teammates? And and how is how, how does that impact the way or the winning that the 49ers are experiencing right now, in your opinion? He's he's 100%. He's batting a 1,000. Like, he is doing everything from the moment he got there. And, I mean, as soon as the season was over, I mean, I had, you know, a guy in the locker room tell me that the locker room would be pissed if somehow Brock Purdy was not the starting quarterback next season. Well, we all knew that as long as he was healthy, as long as that surgery went the way it was planned, he was going to be the starting quarterback. And so – I, I've, I've seen teams, you know, like even like Alex Smith. I mean, there were times where as well-respected as he was, you know, there was some grumblings, you know, there was whatever Crabtree or whomever it might be, you know, wanting the ball more, or he didn't push it down the field as much as some people wanted. And he uh, talked about a guy who did everything the right way. You know, he, it took him a while to kind of find his footing as an NFL quarterback and to find his confidence and uh, to, to kind of have that swagger, which I think he really developed uh, his last couple of years with the 49ers and then onward in his NFL career. But Purdy just has this like bizarre sense of 
confidence, self-assuredness, and the experience to make like some unbelievable throws. I mean, like, some of the throws he makes when he's, you know, releasing the ball. And if you stop the, you know, the, the end zone angle, you can't tell who he's throwing to or how any pass could possibly be completed. And then you, you know, it's almost like he has this incredible vision to see like two seconds ahead of time. You'll know, make the throws he makes to no one. And next thing you know, the defense is going that way. The receiver is going that way and hits a guy in perfect stride. I mean, that stuff can't be taught. And that stuff can't show up at the combine with a measurement of miles per hour on velocity or a 40 yard dash or any of that. And I think it in college too, I think it's so difficult for NFL teams to evaluate college quarterbacks is because, yeah, I don't know how many of those throws are made at the college level. Those kind of trust anticipation, timing, precision throws most of the time, especially with the really good schools, you know, when, when you're talking about the, you know, Alabama's or Ohio states and heck I'll even say North Dakota state at that level, you're throwing to open receivers. Like these guys are running down the field wide open. So all you have to do is play pitch and catch generally speaking. And so I, I don't know how many of those throws that Brock Purdy made at Iowa state, but that's, I think that's why it's such a difficult thing to evaluate because there's no perfect metric to determine how a quarterback is going to succeed at the NFL level. It's almost like a, a different sport just because of the, the skill set is, is certainly not number one. The, the aptitude and the vision and the anticipation and all that definitely ranks above a guy who can you know throw the ball 60 miles an hour. Matt, you've been around – uh, this team a long time. You've seen a lot of quarterbacks. This is the second time you've said that. Like, are you guys, are you guys getting ready to like hand me a shovel and start digging my own grave? Like, what's Matt, you are so old. <laughs> well, that's better. At least you're not beating around the bush. No, is is Brock Purdy the best 49ers quarterback since Steve Young? Oh boy, that's a good question. I, I tell you what, um, based on how he's played in these 13 games and I consider it a third, you know, what, what we've seen from his is 13 games. Yeah. You know, I know it's, I think it's 10, 10 regular season starts three in the postseason, but it's 13 games where he came in against the dolphins. I don't even consider the NFC championship game because yeah. he played fewer than half the snaps in that game. They're 13 and zero in those games and his worst game was still not very bad. Like his, and the, we're talking postseason pressure and everything else. Um, I, I would say, and I, I have no reason to think that he's a flash in the pan. Um, and the reason I say that is a because he had already faced Seattle once last year and then mm -hmm. faced them in the playoffs. Seattle is always a well coached defensive team led by Pete Carroll. So if they thought that they had the formula figured out, they would have brought it out there in the playoff game. What happens? Brock Purdy throws for 332 yards. Also the Cowboys. Dan Quinn is about as good a defense coordinator as there is. You know, the Cowboys wanted to win that game Sunday night. They had no answers for Brock Purdy. So the question in the off season was our defense is going to catch up to Brock Purdy. He just finds a way to stay one step ahead. And the, the design of this offense keeps it that way because if teams try to take something away, then something else is open. So that's a very long way of saying, based on the throws he makes, the composure, the leadership, and everything else, playoff victories, uh, yeah, I think he is. I think he's the best quarterback since Steve Young. Wow. That's a that's quite the statement. Well, you might, get, I mean, you might get aggregated for that. Yeah, geez, not that again. <laughs> um, you know, okay, you can make the you can make the argument for obviously Jeff Garcia, three time Pro Bowl player, and I, I guess you'd have to say, you know, three times making it to the Pro Bowl with the 49ers, and then I think maybe a couple other times without you know not being with the 49ers. Uh, but I'm I'm merely saying that if you project what he's done over, I mean, he, if this continues, clearly he's going to be 
a Pro Bowl right. player. Mm-hmm. And if you continue, if he continues what he's doing, he's going to be a freaking MVP. And the last MVP of the four years I've had at the quarterback position, or well, any position, Steve Young. So mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that. I, I you know, I want to kind of, you know, I don't want to go crazy with this, but there's just I, I can't. I can't possibly poke a hole in anything Brock Purdy has done since he's been, you know, elevated or worked his way into the starting lineup. Yeah, he's undefeated. You're not, re- you're not, you're not ready to say he's better than Sam Darnold, though. <laughs> well, he, you should see Sam Darnold throw. Okay, <laughs> bastard. I was not going to make the Sam Darnold joke, but I'm glad it wasn't me I mean, who did. You should see. I mean, Sam Darnold throws the ball better than Brock Purdy. There's I've heard no that. Thousand percent. He does. Thousand There's percent. no question he does. But Sam Darnold doesn't have all those other attributes that I talked about. So He's not yeah. a better quarter. Sam Darnold, I mean, the first time I saw him throw, I had guys on the sideline coming up and said, boy, I was going to ridicule you, but yeah, <laughs> you might be right. So, you know, Sam Darnold can flat out throw it. But if Sam Darnold were called upon, Fort Harris would still win some games. They would still be a good team. But, man, the, the stuff that Brock Purdy does, just his next level ability to to play the position, you know, he's far better than, I don't know, far better. But, he, yeah, he yeah, I'd say that. He's far better than Sam Darnold. Yeah, I, I talked to, I think I mentioned this on the podcast before, and I wrote about it for the B, but uh, I talked to Tony Romo in – uh, Lake Tahoe during the golf tournament. Nice and, name drop there. That's so sad. Well, I mean, we have the great Matt Mayoko on the pod, so I figured that's <laughs> that's sort of what we're doing today. Um, but I, I asked him about Brock Purdy specifically, and the thing he said, he just has a unique uh, a unique level of spatial awareness. And I never really heard about a quarterback talked about in those terms, right? Like I've never heard people say something like that about a quarterback. It's always well, he's really accurate. His fundamentals really good, whatever it's, it, it was the unique spatial awareness that he has and just sort of the body control and the, the ability to, you know, throw the ball to the right spot. And you mentioned with the anticipation, um, I, I don't know. I just find that really, I, I find that really interesting and unique because that's not something, you know, when, when you listen to people evaluate quarterbacks, it's like, well, that guy's not really that spatially aware. That's not really something that no. That you hear that you hear a whole. I mean, lot. I said that about you, Chris, but for quarterback, <laughs> no, I haven't. That I'm not spatially aware. Yes, yeah, does, you you kind of like voice. sometimes you invade my space when we're when we're together. But yeah, that's anyway. fair. It's like, that's whoa, fair. hey, spatial awareness, man. <laughs> Say that a lot around Chris. Um, I don't know. I was I was trying to parlay that into a question, but well, I think it's, can I just yeah? I I, I kind of like what I said earlier. Not that I'm, you know, patting my, break my hand, arm, patting myself on the back, but it's almost like he gets a snapshot in his brain of what's going to happen a second and a half or two seconds later. Yeah. And that is, that is so unique. I mean, some of those passes that he threw in this game against the Cowboys and he does it every week and it's just, I don't know, see the, the trust um, it's, it's knowing the design of the offense. It's knowing the design of the defense. It's knowing where to put it and then being accurate, precision, precision, the rhythm, the timing, all that stuff. So yeah, I mean, spatial awareness, absolutely. All of that stuff. Yeah. I, I think Kyle see- Shanahan oh, was ahead, like, he, <laughs> after the game on Sunday, that was probably the happiest I've seen Kyle Shanahan really since like a playoff game maybe like the Packers playoff game after the 2021 season. Um, I don't know. I just, I get the feeling that there, like there was so much talk about Kirk cousins and how much Kyle Shanahan really liked Kirk cousins. I think we finally gotten to that point where Kyle Shanahan likes a quarterback better than he liked Kirk cousins. And I think he, I think he's genuinely over the moon about what he's getting from Brock Purdy. Okay. So I got made fun of for Sam Darnold. I'm going to make fun of you for Kirk cousins. How many Kirk cousins stories did you write that off season? Uh, I was absolutely correct because later Kyle Shanahan, I forget exactly when he went on Tim Kawakami's podcast and said, yeah, we were planning on trading for or signing Kirk Cousins. And so, yes, I, I, I had, we can all be correct because I was, I'm correct about Sam Darnold. (laughs) Um, Well, here's the thing. I mean, now, okay, here's a question for you. Sure. If the 49ers could trade straight up, Brock Purdy for any quarterback in the league, they wouldn't do it because of the not. contract. Well, yeah, 
but still they would not they there is not a quarterback in the league that they would trade straight up for Brock Purdy. Not one. Is that a question or a statement? That feels like a I statement. Love to, it's a question. <laughs> so if, and the Chiefs, say, if the Chiefs called and said, we want Brock Purdy to take Patrick Mahomes off our hands, they'd say no. Yeah. Yeah, because you know what? Then the foreigners would have to like make some very significant changes to their roster. Yeah. Man, Matt is bringing the takes today. Well, I mean, they did right? just clear a bunch of cap space, though. You know, I heard that. Sure. <laughs> okay. And the other part of it is, I mean, Kyle Shanahan has a guy who runs his offense as well as any quarterback that he's had. Yeah. So, I mean, is Patrick Mahomes a better player than Brock Purdy? I mean, maybe this is, of course. Everybody yes. knows. I mean, he's yeah. he's an MVP. He's a two-time Super Bowl winner. He's a great quarterback who's going to be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Obviously, we can't say that about Brock Purdy. But all the things that Brock Purdy brings to the table, I mean, we could just we could make a list a hundred long of all everything he brings to the table. And very high up on that list is he's all that as a player and off the field and everything else, but also he's basically under a set contract for the next two seasons and Mm -hmm. enables this team to stay together. I mean, if, if uh, you know, just of course, I mean, it's a, it's a silly conversation, but that's why I brought it up. I mean, they would be paying, I don't know what Mahomes is making now. I know he just redid his contract, but he's He's got to be up. 50 million or 50 whatever million call it. Yeah. He's, well, the cap hit this year is 37 million. So he's essentially like what? 38 times. what? Yeah. Brock I mean, they could fit in, they could fit in that contract, but for now, right. But you know, the, at some point they would have to get rid of so many players and they wouldn't be able to resign uh, you know, Brandon Ayuk, and they might have to make a tough decision on Debo Samuel or George Kittle or Trent. I mean, so they would have a really difficult time keeping the team together. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe they would trade for Patrick Mahomes. I just, I, I think that they like what they know and what they know right now is a quarterback who is just spot on basically with everything he's done. It feels like the players have this really like public reverence for Brock Purdy in a way that they they haven't for any other quarterback in in this in this Kyle Shanahan era. Is that the case behind the scenes too? From uh, what you gather? Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, I'd say so. I think everybody liked Jimmy, but Jimmy was kind of you know kind of an oddball. You know, whenever yeah. a guy disappears off the face of the earth and doesn't return text messages, you know, I know is a, a running joke and all that, but that's a little bit weird. You know, let's yeah. admit that. Um, but yeah, I think just everything, uh, everything he, yeah, he has a, an ability to, to relate to people. And, you know, I mean, you hear players talking about him, you know, players on both sides of the ball. It's, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I would say in the, in the Shanahan era, absolutely. And even going back so far, you know, going back a ways, um, they also have done a really good job of getting, kind of the right kinds of guys. So they don't have a bunch of disturbers in the locker room. I just did a story this morning about, you know, I asked Brandon and Ayuk, what, you know, can you tell through the course of the practice week, who's going to shine on game day? You know, which of the receivers, you know, between Ayuk, Debo Samuel, George Kittle. And he said, no, he said, there will be times where, you know, during the week of practice, Kittle's catching all kinds of passes. I'm thinking, oh, Kittle's going to have a big game. And then he doesn't, you know, he has one target. And Ayuk, who wasn't expecting a whole lot of action, he gets six targets, you know, 148 yards. And then another game, this game against the the Cowboys, Ayuk was like, man, this is going to be a big day, another big day for me. And it ends up, it's, you know, the George Kittle show. And so Brock is also in a really good situation where, he has a you know tremendous supporting cast, but also if Debo Samuel doesn't have any catches like he he didn't have against the Cardinals, or Kittle doesn't have a big game, you know no one's bending his ear, no one's complaining, no one's you know crying. They know at some point it'll all come around. So 
Um, I to, yeah. for that I I give John Lynch and the personnel department, and I guess also Shanahan a lot of credit for just you know getting the right kinds of guys in that locker room. Speaking of uh, disturbers, this is this is the the best way i could try to transition away from brock purdy into into something else um, <laughs> randy gregory pro- probably yeah. going to make his 49ers debut on sunday um he obviously has a checkered pass with the suspensions and everything like that um i don't know that he's necessarily viewed as a as a disturber but i would say you know anybody with that type of history would come with a little bit of risk just in terms of you know availability or whatever um, the, it seems like a low risk move from the 49ers perspective, given the Broncos are paying the, the vast majority of his contract and the Niners didn't give up so much in that trade. Um, but what's your what's your expectation for what the 49ers are going to get from Gregory on Sunday in Cleveland and, and the rest of the season? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, he, you know, his career has been more about potential than production. Uh, but as you mentioned, I mean, there's zero risk and they, they're not getting much production other than week one from that defensive end opposite of Bosa. So, you know, if you look at where the weakness of the 49ers is that, that actually might be it where, you know, the two tackles are pretty darn good. Obviously Bosa is as good as it gets. That other edge rusher spot could be a, a position, uh, where they could, you know, use an upgrade. So, uh, what they gave up wasn't much both in draft pick compensation and also as far as uh, the salary, basically he's playing for the veteran minimum the rest of the year. So, I mean, my guess on Sunday against the Browns is that he suits up and he plays, you know, 15 snaps, 15 to 20 snaps, and then it'll kind of build from there. And heck, if he gets off to a good start Sunday and gets some good rushes, then it might be more than that. But I, I would think that it'll kind of become apparent as the season goes on you know, just by how often we see him in the offensive backfield uh, getting after the quarterback. But, you know, he's he's a $16 million a year player, at least the Denver Broncos thought he was when they signed him to that contract. And so for the 49ers to get him under the deal they did, um, it's, you know, I can't believe any other team, I can't believe there wasn't another team under those cer- same circumstances that wouldn't have given up a little bit more in draft pick, knowing that, you know, they would, they would only have to foot the bill for the veteran minimum. Um, if nothing else, just to keep them away from the 49ers. But uh, I, I, I see it as a very low risk move. And yesterday on uh, Wednesday, I met him and he was, he said all the right things. Um, he, he looked genuine and, um, He is excited about fitting in and said he's coming here with no expectations and excited to get to work for Chris Kosarek. And I think he sees this scheme, which is a very aggressive, put your hand in the ground, go get the quarterback kind of scheme. He sees that as being a really good fit for him. So I would, I would suspect that initially he'll be a situational pass rusher coming in on third downs. And then as he gets more comfortable and if he, is good on base downs too, maybe getting the work into the mix a little bit more there. But I, I would think initially third downs is where you'll see him. The trade deadline's coming up on October 31st. Do you think Randy Gregory is kind of it, or do you think that they'll go try and improve maybe at defensive end? If, if Gregory's not working out over the next couple of weeks, uh, maybe on the offensive line, what, what do you think? Uh, I would think that I, I would be, surprised if anything becomes available I, I would say the the only contingency would be I think this is why they cleared so much cap space is if there's a situation where one of their significant players gets injured and they have an opportunity to go get somebody but I I don't see them going outside at this point and getting a starter at any other position I, I just don't know that those I don't know that anybody's available that would be an upgrade over the guys they already have so i I would think that that would be more if there's something uh catastrophic that happens to one of their starters that makes sense who who do you who is like because we see it on the field like the 49ers again we've talked about it they don't seem like they have any weaknesses is there anybody that that stood out to you um that's played above expectation 
outside of Brock Purdy that's been sort of a surprise in your mind? How about if I lump them all together? I, I would say the sure. offensive line. You know, I, okay. I would think a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, the 49ers offensive line. And it's it, it, I realize I've been doing this long enough. I don't know if you guys know this, but I've been doing this a long time. You're so old. What? Just you look real, so young. <laughs> yeah, thank, well, thank so you. Surprise. <laughs> the makeup. It's the, uh, the Botox. Um, I think everybody, every almost every team in the league or every fan base in the league, except for maybe like two or three, think that their cornerbacks are horrible and their offensive line is horrible. Because the only time you talk about those two positions, you know, other than if a guy gets an interception, but usually it's so and so got beat on the play to give up that 55 yard touchdown, or so and so got beat on the sack. The 49ers offensive line is, you know, if you look at it objectively, it's probably one of the top five, seven offensive lines in the league. And so that's probably the area where I don't know that the the team necessarily a surprise with how well they've played and how clean they've kept Brock Purdy. Um, but that might be the area. And I'd say McKivitz, what, what kind of struck me week one was, I think some of those were on Purdy as far as not getting rid of the ball uh, quickly enough, but every one of those sacks that, uh, that TJ Watt had, McKivitz was not getting any help. And so that that showed you right there, too, that they had enough confidence in him to hold up one-on-one against T.J. Watt. Of course, he didn't hold up one-on-one. But then talking to him that next week, I felt like you know th- there was a sense of confidence. And since then, I know he gave up a spin move sack against the Cardinals. But I, I would say – by and large on that offensive line, it's been a pretty good group as far as protecting Brock Purdy and also creating the holes in the running game. This week, it sounds like Deshaun Watson is not going to play for Cleveland. He didn't practice Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, Justina Anderson from CBS Sports reported that he's not going to play. Is there any... Is there any, I I guess, concern is is the word I'll, I'll use that this is where maybe the 49ers get complacent 10 a.m. start against a rookie quarterback. Just try and toss their helmets on the I, field. I think it's going to be P.J. Walker. So I think P.J. Walker is going to start. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, I don't I don't think there's – this group, I don't sense any complacency. I mean, Fred Warner was talking about a, a not a blown assignment, but how he played a wrong technique on a pass play. Sunday night. So every guy, I mean, it's a very mature level headed group of guys. My guess is a lot of those guys on the defensive line are thinking this is a, an opportunity to to feast, you know, a guy like to Sean Gibson coming back to where he started his, his career. Um, the, the amazing thing. And I, you know, at some point I would think the 49ers are not going to play their best game, but I don't think it'll be a letdown. I just think that some some games it just doesn't happen. I mean, the the Eagles probably don't feel like they played their best game when they played Washington. You know, they ended up winning in overtime. So um, I, I don't I don't think you'll see them getting complacent or oh looking past an opponent. I think when you get an opponent like this, I think offensively they know they have their work cut out for them because Cleveland has a very good defense. But I think mm-hmm. off, uh, for the 49ers defense, it's probably an opportunity like. Hey, let's let's get a shutout. You know, let's you know Nick Bosa. Let let me uh, let me go get three sacks. So I think yeah. I don't think that really I don't think that really occurs the as far as the letdown or looking past an opponent. You you mentioned Fred Warner, and obviously he's a different type of of linebacker than the 49ers have had in the past. Whether it's Patrick Willis or Navarro Bowman, um, do you think he's he's already in that tier of like? you know, sort of at his, at the peak of his powers, like an all-time great linebacker, like, like those guys are. And do you have any takes that about Fred Warner's place in history that he's like the best defensive player since Ronnie Lott, or they wouldn't trade him for Patrick Mahomes or, or anything like that? Uh, I see what you're doing. You're trying to bait me into more uh, <laughs> aggregation. What's your hottest material. Fred Warner take? Yeah. You want me to just say, yeah, he's better than Patrick Willis. <laughs> um, I mean, he's certainly on that path. Yeah. What is he in? He's in his seventh year, I think. And uh, six, six, six year. Yeah. Okay. So he's, and he's had uh, two all pros. That's, that's, you know, 
that's rarefied air there. Um, Patrick Willis was all pro every year. You know, he was pro bowl every year. So, uh, you know, right now he's playing at the absolute top of his game. And could you say that right now he's playing as well as Patrick Willis did in when Patrick Willis was in his prime? Yeah, you probably can say that. Uh, but now he's he's just got to do it year after year. But no, I, I mean, I look at these two guys right now, Greenlaw and Warner, and they are, I mean, they're difference makers. I mean, they fly around. They're tone setters. They're they're fast. They're aggressive. They get after you. Uh, they do it all. And so I think they're very much in that same conversation, same breath as Willis and Bowman. Yeah. I, they, just the thing that jumps, they just haven't done it, you know, as long as those guys did. The thing that stands out to me is how like Patrick Willis and Navarro Bowman were so perfectly suited to play against the offenses of their time. Like they were just the prototypical modern linebacker for their era. And it feels like Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw are just kind of the next evolution of that. Yeah. And you know what? I, I remember early on uh, Navarro's first full year as a starter and even into his second year, you know, you'd be watching a game and you'd go, Oh man, look at Willis. Isn't he something? And then you go yeah. like, Oh no, no, that's, Oh, that was Bowman. You don't you don't have that with these two guys. I mean, you yeah. know Fred Warner and you know Dre Greenlaw. So they're you know they're different body types. Uh, I guess similar skill sets. I mean, Greenlaw is just so aggressive and always towing that Committing line. Penalties and, and always oh. yeah, always really <laughs> right there on the edge. And I think kind of gotten a in some cases a, a bad rap. Uh, you know, some of those penalties have absolutely been deserved, but none of them so far this year have risen to uh, the threshold of getting fined. Now, I was surprised they didn't throw the flag on him Sunday night when he tossed uh, Tony Pollard out of bounds, and maybe he will get a fine for that, even though it wasn't penalized. But um, no, I, I'd say they're where Bowman and, and Willis were, I, I mean, darn near completely interchangeable. Uh, I'd say Warner and Greenlaw are a little bit different and maybe complement each other in different ways and, and maybe even better than Willis and Bowman because, you know, kind of a, um, because of that ability, they, they have, you know, slightly different skill sets. One of the things I get asked when I go on like various radio stations or whatever is, is, um, is this season a failure for the 49ers if they don't win a Super Bowl? And before the season, my my initial thought was like, well, like you can have a really good season without winning a championship. I think that's, you know, there there are a lot of other teams that would love to have the 49ers problems if, you know, losing in the NFC Championship game or losing in the Super Bowl was, was deemed a failure. Um, but as the season's gone on through five games, I've come to the point where like, no, they're so good right now to where it would feel like a disappointment mm -hmm. if if they didn't win the Super Bowl, considering how high they set the bar. What I'm curious about and, and what I want to ask you is like, how do you think 49ers ownership and, and their brass feels about that exact question? Because, um, you know, it's easy for the fan base who's obviously far I mean, the fan base is invested don't get me wrong but it's not it's not their jobs it's not their livelihood like how do you view ownership's answer to that question like do you think jed york will view this season as a failure and it will be like super heartbreaking or is jed york of the mind they're like yeah we got a great team and if we don't win that sucks but we'll probably be as good as anybody else next year too well i think from ownership and management all they can do is is what they've done they've they put the team in position to win it all. There's no question. I mean, you ask anybody around the nation or anybody who's watched one NFL game, you know, name four teams and the Super Bowl champ is going to come out of one of those four teams. Everybody's going to pick the 49ers. So they put themselves in that position. But once the playoffs begin, and, and remember the playoffs begin three months, you know, it's three months away. So in order to answer the question, will it be a disappointment if they don't win it? I'd have to know how they didn't win it. Like last year to me was, yeah, everybody was disappointed, 
that they didn't win, but also when guys left that locker room in Philadelphia, they knew there were no regrets because they had no chance to win when, when your quarterback, you know, doesn't have a right arm and he throws right-handed theoretically. And I would say almost the same thing the year before where they made it to the NFC championship game and Jimmy Garoppolo, you know, had a, a torn ligament in his thumb and he had a shoulder that needed surgery. And so, you know, if they're, if they're playing at full strength and, and they make it to the NFC Championship game or the Super Bowl. And there's some mess ups, whether it's coaching or, you know, a high profile player missing an assignment or whatever. You know, it's it's, it's a tough question to, to answer because I would say at this point, not knowing how the end would come. Oh, everybody in the organization would be disappointed to, you know, flip forward four months and see uh, the the sports almanac that has some other team than the 49ers winning the Super Bowl. But, you know, I, I almost think that it was it was less painful last year um, because of the way it ended. I mean, it was basically mm-hmm. completely out of their hands of how the, the end of the season came about. Yeah. Uh, Matt. This has been great, man. Thank you so much uh, for your time. I know your bedtime's coming up, so we're yeah. gonna oh, get wow. you out of here. Yeah, my uh, I got some uh, milk on the stove right now, warming up the milk before I go to bed. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I'll great, there. Thank you. Um, Kyle, Chris, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me on, and uh, for this being my final appearance here on Grinner. <laughs> uh, it was good that we went out on a high note. Yeah, oh, that's, that's great to hear, Maddie. All right. We will talk to you soon. Hopefully, um, hopefully mm. I'll see you around and uh, safe travels to Cleveland, my friend. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.